Hello, my brothers and sisters. This is Elder Joseph Stafford coming to you again from Man from Heaven Ministries, teaching on kingdom principles. We want to continue the process that we had on our last video on add super to your power in God. That's add super to your power in God. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I want to add to that particular process, give a continuation of that teaching because there's something there that we need to look into as to what will make us more super in God. Allow the super or the above or the more to be a present thing in our lives now. Let's pray. Father, we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We thank you for all the things you're doing for us, through us, and to us. We ask you, Father, that you bless the hearers, that their ears be open to hear what you're saying to them. Blow open their spirit, their eyes, so they can see more of the kingdom and the righteousness that's there for them. I thank you, Father, right now for doing this and give you praise, honor, glory in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Well, we talked about super being meaning above, more, addition to, what's natural. So we have a limited amount of understanding about what's natural. We have a limited amount of understanding what is super. So let's go a little further and find out how we get there. Because understand this, everything we want does not come on a, um, a bed of ease. We have to work toward things. The scripture tells us after we get saved, work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. So that fear and trembling is that we want to make sure it's right. So, as I mentioned before, my three-step process is fasting, prayer, study. This gets us in a position where we know God, we understand who He is, and why He is, and then why we are in Him. And by doing that, we learn to love Him for who He is and not because of what He can do for us. And then we can operate in that kingdom, doing kingdom principles on this earth as we usher in the kingdom waiting for the return of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Now, with that being said, we have to look at us walking in faith. Remember the scriptures tell us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So hopefully, prayerfully, this word is coming to you will help develop and build up faith in you. But also, another word says, work out your own soul, salvation, with fear and trembling. Back to that again. we got to make sure that we know what we know in our inner being. And it takes a continuation of the three steps again, fasting, prayer, and study. That should be done not once, not during a certain period of time, but continually as long as you're on this earth. Because the devil knows the word. He can also slip you up and, 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 and turn a whole different perspective as to what God really wants to say to you. So let's go to some scriptures and talk about what um what God is doing for us. See, we want to know a question. Where does the power come from? We talk about the tenacity of a person. We, we're going to go to Genesis 32, 23 to 32. We're going to talk about a situation that occurred with a man named Jacob. Let's start at verse 23. This King James Version. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. This speaks of his wife, wives, his children, his cattle, all that he had. He sent it over the brook by way of a servant. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. This is the angel or the man. And in the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, the angel, the man, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I would not let thee go except thou bless me. That's the tenacity that we need to have even when things seem to be hard for us, that we won't let go of God and his promises. Not until there's a change, something we can detect 
that will hold us in position. We got to stay there and fight. Hold on. Don't quit. Get what God has for you because work is hard. But being without doing nothing is even harder. So we need to fight the good fight of faith. That means we have confidence that when we fight this fight, we will win. We will prevail. Let's go and see what the angel said to him. And he said, let me go for the day break of it. He said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. Let's stop there for a second. Jacob's name, much like in that day, represented who they were and what they represented. If you remember the story about when Jacob and Esau, his twin brother, were born, Jacob's hand was around Esau's ankle because they said that well, they warred or they battled in the womb. Jacob means heel grabber, heel grabber. And from that day forward, he was one who basically did underhanded things. He stole the birthright from his brother. He, he went through a whole process of doing things underhanded to get what he wanted. He thought he'd go by cust, go away from custom to get his wife, and him had to work seven years for one and working seven more years to get the other one that he really wanted, the one he loved. So he was a heel grabber. He was that that person who um, tried to find a short way out, trying to find a way that was not always convenient. So let's go a little further. And he said, "This is the angel. Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel." For as a prince, thou hast power with God and with men and hath prevailed. Okay. The changing of the name of Israel is prince of God or light of God. He was now positioned because he fought to get what God had for him. He caught, he fought to get what God was preparing him for. He fought to gain what he needed from God, and he became Israel. Now, much like the name change, it took a minute, a little bit, a little bit of time for him to really grab hold to his new name. Because if you notice that as time went on, he sometimes called him Jacob. He sometimes calls him Israel based upon his actions to bring him back in line. The same parallel came when Jesus was walking earth and he spoke to Peter and said, who do men say that I am? He said, thou art the Christ or the Messiah, the son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood did, did, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but God revealed it to you in so many words. Because you received this word that is solid, it's a rock, it's is there because at that point, Peter's name was Simon, which means shifty. He was not stable. But when he said that solid thing, that shiftness became solid, known as Peter, which means rock, or Caiaphas, which means rock. A solid word changed his name. But also remember, as he was growing as a disciple into apostleship, he was sometimes called Simon Peter, because he went back to his old ways and acted like Simon, but he also spoke the promise of Peter into him so he can grow into the Peter. So sometimes our names mean something. We have names now that people pick up out of a book. Um, they figure out ways to do things. And sometimes some of my brothers and sisters realize that they change their names to probably an African name or something that means something that is beneficial in their thinking. But when God gives you a name, there's a promise there. And our name right now is redeemed. No matter what your physical name is, your name is redeemed because you've been delivered and set free because of the sacrifice which Jesus made on the cross so that we can then live eternally, starting now, in the kingdom, walking according to kingdom principles. So let's go a little further. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou doest ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, 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 for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And he passed over Peniel and rose, and the sun rose 
upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel, eaten out of the sinew of shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh, unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew and the shrank, which means, so many words, as a, as a sign or a symbol, his children would not eat the inner portion of a thigh where Jacob was hit by the angel and then knocked his hip out of joint because there was a holiness there, a, a reverence of what took place there, remembering how he fought with this angel until God blessed him. How many of you today really, really willing to fight and hold fast to God bless you? How many of you willing to go through whatever it takes to get there? Go to New Testament now. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. True it is. But then he also says, take up thy cross and follow me. So our, that cross, we said before, and we're going to say it again, is your sins that you're fighting to get rid of. That's working out your soul salvation with fear and trembling. You're now pushing those things away from you by doing what? Fasting, prayer, and study. Get the ammunition in place, become more in love with God so you can recognize who God is, recognize what God has for you, and the ability to know that God's working on your behalf. So let's go a little further. Um, Moses, in the book of Exodus, stood up against Pharaoh. God, at some point, hardened Pharaoh's heart because he chose not to decide to agree what he knew was right, but develop pride to hold on to his gods and his way. So, that being said, God said in verse 16 of chapter 9, And in very deed, and for this cause, I have raised thee up for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout the earth. Can anybody grab hold of that word and grab it to themselves? For this cause, God has raised you up. God has called you now to be called by the Most High, to be called to join air with Christ, to walk above and not beneath the privilege and ability that God has already given you. And I say this to defend a point, is that once you receive the power of God in your life, you don't get haughty or high-minded because that's fleshly. That's worldly. You must humble yourself before God and then find yourself meek before him, deciding to obey his will because meekness means under God's control. And that's a willingness that you do because remember, you are a free agent. You are designed, and not as a robot, but to make decisions to follow God and be part of the family to decide to do what you know is right by spending time with him and loving him and knowing him. Okay? So indeed, in this very deed, and in this very deed, and in this very deed, for this cause, I raise thee up to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Okay, so let's go a little further here. In the book of Acts, it speaks about when the power of God came. And what was done for us during this time? There was a gift given to us called the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And let's start with Acts 2, 33 through 43. And let's see what's said here that will help benefit us to know that that was translated from the Old Testament, now manifest in the New, so we then now can walk according to His will and His purpose. Verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and have received the of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, and hath showed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thee thy foes, thy footstool. 
excuse me. So the statement here for David is not ascended is a statement saying that when he wrote this, he had not ascended. But we believe that based upon what happened when Jesus came out of the grave, all those who were in paradise went with him into heaven. And we, we can search that scripture out later on and I'll share with you in another video. Let's go to verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom he crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when he heard this, when they heard this, they were all pricked in their heart and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent. And I say, don't repeat, but repent. Repent basically means turn 180 degrees away from things that are contrary and negative, away from the um, the word of God, away from the presence of God. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the gift that makes your super in God. So when the gift of the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you then grow in him, you develop in him and become more of what you can be in this land. So that being said, we want to make sure that we understand this. There's nothing of our own that we've done, but accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's go further. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in some other areas. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9. We're going to talk about the gift. I thank my God, starting at verse 4, always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him and in all utterance and in all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you be, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at that real quick. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye be the so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, in other words, the gift of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, is full and founded in you when you accepted him, being baptized into him, okay? That means there's no waiting or wanting. You got all you need in him, but you have to realize all that comes with him. There's gifts, there's a gift of the Holy Spirit, and there's gifts in the Holy Spirit, so everything is wrapped up in the Holy Spirit that's in you, okay? So it goes against the definition that comes in the Greek of Pericles, but now he's an internal walking, talking being inside of you that deals with your spirit, causing you then to submit to God's will. Okay, let's go a little further. Verse eight, who shall also confirm you until the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? Isn't that wonderful? That presence of the Holy Spirit in you is going to confirm in you before God, that you're blameless. There's nothing that can hold you back. There's no hidden or secret sin that can cause you to fall because you've been submissive unto the will of God. You have then fallen into the presence of God and he is now giving you fullness of who he is in you. Isn't that beautiful? He's taking care of us all the way through. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to talk about some of the gifts of the Spirit and the directions of the Spirit, just some of them. So we know that everything is rooted in one primal force. And that's love. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, Amplified Version. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, for others growing out of God's love for me, then I have become an, only a noisy gong or a clang symbol. Just as annoying, just an annoying distraction. And if the and if I have the gift of prophecy and speak a new message from God to the people, 
and understand all mysteries and all and possess all knowledge. And if I have all sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains, but do not have love reaching out to others, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it does me no good at all. Let's go down a little further. Love endures with patience and sincerity. I want you to see that. The reason this is important because love is God, God is love. But he also tells us since God is in us, we also have that same love. And we are now have to endure with patience. And patience is a, is a word that sometimes bother people because it means long suffering in other parts of the scripture, but it does mean an endurance. You have to go through the process. I say that's important because when we talk to our brothers and sisters and we want to help them get to another level, we don't have to use the microwave mentality. We have to look at what's going to take for them to get from point A to point B. What's going to help them get from being full of sin to less sin, to less sin, more or less sin, to redemption. There's a going through process. You have to go along with them with understanding, patience, understanding what they're going through, witnessing from your own experience level, bearing forth the word of Christ. When you walk with this person who's going through, you don't agree with their sin, but you agree with them coming out of their sin. You don't beat them down, but you encourage them to build themselves up. So it's a process that we go through when we witness the people, we share with people, family, friends, foe, those on the street, those that have been in situations. We have to have that patience to go through with them so they can see the glory of God. Because this is based upon, again, the primal scenario that's in our lives because of God, which is love. So this love is outreaching. This love is, is full of doing all the things that he needs for us to do. And I would suggest you go back and look at the video I had on love prior to this because it gives me a little more detail about the types of love, the love that we have, and so forth and so on. So let's go a little further. Um, love does not brag. And it's not proud or arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not provoked nor overly sensitive and easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. It does not rejoice in injustice, but rejoices with the truth when right and truth prevail. Love bears all things, regardless of what comes. Believes all things, looking for the best in each one. Hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times. Endures all things without weakening, without weakening, weak, weakening, blah, without becoming weak. Okay. Love never fails. It never fades nor ends. But as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for the gift of special knowledge, it will pass away. For as we know in part, and we prophesy in part, for our knowledge is fragmentary and incomplete. But when that which is complete and perfect comes, that which is incomplete and partial will pass away. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now, in this time of imperfection, we see in the mirror dimly a blurred vision, a riddle, an enigma. But when that time of perfection comes, we will, re we will see reality face to face. Now I know in part, just in fragments, but when I know fully, just as I've been fully known by God, and now there remains faith, abiding in trust, abiding trust in God and his promises, hope, confident 
expectation of, etern of e eternal salvation. Love, unselfish love for others growing out of God's love for me. These three choice graces, but the greatest of these is love. So that being said, <clears throat> we want to also emphasize it in some more Paul's writings. He writes to the Ephesians in chapter 4. 2 through 12, he says, with all lowliness, meekness, and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, enduring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. <clears throat> Excuse me. But in every but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is, is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying the body of Christ. These are all gifts that God's given to the body. He's also taught about the gifts of love and the fruits of that love. This is the key that causes you then to be able to add super to your power in God. Excuse me. This adds super to your power in God. By understanding these basic principles, that everything is based upon love, it's based upon understanding who he is, it's based upon spending time in his presence, studying his word, Having conversation with God, prayer. Not a monologue, but a dialogue. Where you're talking to him, he's talking back to you. Because we always speak to God and ask God things, but don't wait for the answer. So we're not, we need to change that. Have the conversation. For the scripture says, come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. <clears throat> Though your sin may be scarlet, I will make them white as snow. So at this point, my friends, I'm going to depart. I thank God for you spending time with me today to hear the word that's speaking to your spirit. Let you know where you are and who you are in him. Being the best of yourself. Remember, in order to add super to your power in God, you must fast, pray and study that he may impart these gifts unto you that you can be the best of what he wants you to be in this world and this done is all in all humility in all humbleness before the most high so we give praise honor and glory today for this word we thank you now for the teaching and i pray that <clears throat> that you find your place in him god bless you until next time peace or be peace so you may have peace.